Welcome to another edition of the Open Forum. Once more, we can look together. We have the privilege and the pleasure of looking together into this wonderful book, the Bible, to discover truth. And my, oh my, in these last months, how much have we learned that we never thought was there? Where God indeed is keeping his promise, sealed us up till the time of the end, implying that at the time of the end, there's going to be a lot more information flowing to the human race from the Bible. And indeed, that is what is happening. The Bible is opening up to us with truth after truth that we never suspected was there. And yet we know it's true because as we check it out and find that it is, what we're learning is in harmony with all that the Bible teaches. And it's, it's, then we know that we have truth. And the Bible will never set us astray if we faithfully follow the rules that God has given us, that we compare Scripture with Scripture, and that we remember that Christ spoke in parables and so on. And then as we pray for wisdom, as God the Holy Spirit guides us, we will come to truth and we'll know we've come to truth when we find harmony with all everything else that we have learned. Well, this is your program. We want to hear from you. So, shall we take our first call tonight, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi, Brother Campin. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, Mark uh, 13, verses 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, to whom they apply, to the believers or to the unbelievers? Because I'm very much confused with these, those verses. I don't know what to say about it. Well, the fact is that God wrote the Bible. I can understand your confusion. God wrote the Bible so that throughout the, uh, the church age, which encompassed 1955 years, and immediately uh, during which time most of the time we've had the whole uh, Bible, and there's been nothing added to it subsequently. Uh, and during that time, it was God's distinct purpose to... Uh, make us understand that Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And so, consequently, we can find many verses that speak to that. And, and this is what has been taught in the churches. Correctly so. This is what the Bible taught all through the church age. We could not know the timing of the end. God did not disclose that at all. But you'll notice, as it talks about Mark in Mark 13, it starts using the word watch. Watch. We read in verse, uh, uh, in, in verse 34, for the spirit of, or, or take verse 33, take ye heed, watch and pray. For you know not when the time is. Now, if he's coming as a thief in the night, what's the purpose of watching? What? How can how, how can we learn anything by watching if the principle holds that he's coming as a thief in the night? Well, God put the word watch there so that it would start having meaning when God got ready to open our understanding of the timeline of history all the way till the end. And as we have been searching the Bible for time information in these days, we've learned a whole lot about time that has never been known before. There's no seminary in the world today that really gets into the timetable of history with any accuracy at all. Because during the church age, 
that was impossible. But beginning about 50 years ago, we learned that creation occurred in the year 11,013 B.C. We learned it right out of the Bible. And then through the years that followed, we slowly on began to understand a whole lot more dates of time information. And then, lo and behold, in this last couple of years, we have begun to learn exactly when the end of time is. Now, we wonder, why did God do that? First of all, he did not want people concerned about his coming, the timetable of his coming. But get busy and get the gospel out. Uh, That's your task, and it isn't to worry about the timetable of Christ's return. But now that we're very close to the end, it is God's purpose that the true believers know very accurately the time so that we can carry out our job of warning the world. In the days of Noah, God selected Noah to warn the world. In the days of Jonah, he selected Jonah to warn Nineveh that their end was coming. In our day, he has selected every true believer that is scattered throughout the world to warn the world that we're ver- the precise timetable of the very end. And that is why now we read uh, that that about these, uh, why we are to watch, because we learn this from the Bible. And now as we have found this, we're not asking anybody to trust any one of us. We have prepared material that comes right from the Bible, and they, anybody can check it out for themselves. We make the little booklet, We're Almost There. That's available in many different languages, and it's available on the Internet. It's available uh, to anyone who writes or calls for it without cost of any kind. And they don't have to listen or, or agree with us, but they should at least do themselves a big favor and see what information has come out of the Bible and then make their own decision whether we really have found a correct answer to the timeline of history. Thank you, Brother Kevin, and it was nice talking to you again. Thanks very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Harold. How are you? Very well, thank you. Okay, we. my question is, you have Mary, the mother of God. Well, you like to say Mary, the mother of Jesus. You have John the Baptist, Noah, Moses. Do they all have automatic salvation? Uh, well, when you say automatic salvation, if anybody becomes saved, it is because he was chosen before God ever created anything, they had already been named and chosen to become saved. And God obligated himself so that at the time they came into existence, either a few minutes after birth or an hour before they die, that at some point he had to give them a new resurrected soul which is a follow-up on the fact that they had been chosen. Uh, He had already paid for their sins, made all the provision for their salvation before he ever created them or anything else in the world. And uh, so to use the word automatic, yes, in a sense it's all automatic. However, God works this out for each individual differently. There are people who become saved as a baby and live all their life with a real desire to serve the Lord 
there are people like the thief on the cross who uh, who lived a rebellious life against God uh, until an hour before he was crucified, before he was uh, executed in a most shameful way. Then suddenly he became saved so that his execution turned out not to be an execution, but to be the grand moment when he would leave his body and go to live and reign with Christ in heaven. Now, the people I spoke about, now, we can never match what they did for Jesus and God. We can have Moses and John the Baptist. We can never live up to that. But you always said that God is not partial. That means he's, you know, everybody, every man and woman is equal. But that's not true, especially what you're saying. It just, they well, have a well, big uh, advantage. Uh, excuse me, John the Baptist and Moses and David and Abraham and Noah, they had to become saved just like anyone else. They were no different than anyone who finally becomes the child of God. It just turns out that God used them as his servants for special purposes, and therefore they, their lives, to, to some degree, are recorded in the Bible. But in actuality, they are no different than anyone who becomes saved today. All right, thank you for taking my call. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open uh, Forum. Mr. Camping, um, in your book, um, We Are Almost There, on page 65, uh, you write, Those who have never heard. Throughout the history of the world, there are those who have lived and died without ever having heard or read any words from the Bible. And because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, <clears throat> excuse me, Romans 10:17, we must believe that none of these people were elected by God to become saved. Therefore, it was not necessary for God at any time in their lifetime to place them under the hearing of God's word. Now, uh, what happens to these people their bodies and souls on May 21st, 2011. Well, are you that. talking about them still living at that time, or are you talking about them having died before that time? Because there's a great difference. Who have lived and died before without, that time. Okay, so what yeah, well, happens you, to you, their you, bones? You know, it's very, very... Interesting. God is very merciful. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He has pleasure in bringing glory to himself. And a very strong aspect of his glory is his mercy, is his kindness, his loving kindness. Uh, uh, and he therefore has no desire uh, to, uh, uh, to pour out his wrath on anybody unnecessarily. Now, most of these people have lived out their life. They have never heard from the Bible. They've never heard about the judgment of God. Deep in their hearts, they may have had some, some idea that, uh, that there is a higher being that might judge them, but they can't really put their finger on it and it doesn't really disturb them too much. And frankly, they find that they can live out their life, this life, and have quite a bit of enjoyment. They can smell the flowers. They can enjoy the warm sunshine. They can have good health, perhaps, for a while. And uh, they can uh, enjoy many things of this world. And then they die. Now, it is true that they are being punished for their sins because uh, anything that is not pleasing to God is sin, but they are not aware of that punishment. They're not consciously 
aware of that punishment. They don't realize that their death is in actuality an execution. The wages of sin is death. But they don't look upon it as an execution. It's maybe a, uh, they may have some kind of a, of a religion or a theory or whatever that when they die, they're going to the happy hunting ground or, or they're going to uh, go into higher glory of some kind. And they're resting in that. They're all wrong. Of course, that won't happen. But nevertheless, they have that the enjoyment of thinking that way. When uh, they, uh, they don't realize at all that they have lost an enormous inheritance. They had been created in the image of God. And had they become saved, they would inherit eternal life. And they would inherit the new heaven and the new earth. And that was an enormous future that God had prepared for those who uh, did become saved. And they know nothing about that. And so that, again, doesn't disturb them at all. Uh, the best that we can say is that they died and, and, re- and were, were sad that they had to give up this life. They couldn't see their children grow up or they couldn't pursue their career any further, or whatever. Now, that's the mercy of God. And most people who have lived during the last 13,000 years and have died have that kind of experience with the wrath of God. Now, there is one more element in the wrath of God that they will endure, but they'll know nothing about it. And that will occur on the day of the rapture, when their body or remains, whatever is left of them, whether it's a body or bones or or dust or whatever, will be uh, uh, thrown out of the grave and and will litter the ground and and be a shame. They will be shamed before God and before all the principalities and powers that God has ever created. But these individuals will never experience uh, any of this in their own consciousness because they, when they died, they are dead. However, when we get to the end of the world, there are two things we have to keep in mind. Number one, God has really impressed upon the children of God. They've got to declare the time of the end to the whole world. That is really being impressed upon our minds and so that if possible, every human being or virtually every human being will know that May 21, 2011 is the day of the rapture. It's the day of judgment when the day of judgment begins. And they must know that now, in the months that lie between now and then, they can cry to God for mercy. They can plead with God. Maybe God will have mercy. They can, uh, they can come in a broken and contrite heart and in complete humility, Oh, God, have mercy, like the Ninevites when they sat in sackcloth and ashes, and they can try to do their best in doing the will of God. So they start reading the Bible, maybe for the first time. And there will be many of these who will become saved. On the other hand, the greatest number of the people of the world will not. They will hear the fact that there is a the time of the end is being talked about everywhere, and yet they will be totally in in uh, uh, denial. They will not want to face it. It's too horrible to think about, and they like this world, and and uh, uh, they're not about to take this seriously. And they will come right into that day of judgment fully alive and then 
Death is everywhere. Many will die the first day when there's a great earthquake that throws open all the graves. Many will die from plagues that will follow. Many will die, uh, 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 still be alive right up till the last day, 153 days later, when God will finish his destruction of this earth and burn the whole world with fire so that nothing is left anymore. But that is the terrible future of those who do not listen to the information that May 21 is a serious date to consider. They have to understand that Christ is coming, and if they're not saved by that time, they will experience, they will know, they will know that they have uh, 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 lost their life. And, and if they are in the church, and about two billion people living today have some connection with the Bible, and they have always thought that they are the ones who will be raptured, and everybody else is left behind. And now to their utter horror, to their terrible consternation, they're going to be found, they're going to find out that they have been left behind. And then it will, uh, it will come upon them in great sorrow as they recognize that they've lost this life and that they uh, will not have eternal life, that they will not be with Christ forevermore. And so for them it will be a particular shock a particularly serious punishment that they will feel, very much like the rich man in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, who was uh, in great sorrow because he recognized he had lost his life in this world so that all those joys are discontinued. And he looks at, at Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, recognizing that Lazarus has all of the blessings of eternal life, and he has been denied this. And so he is in great sorrow. And that's really saying what is going to happen to those who are in the churches during that period. There's going to be weeping, and they're going to be gnashing their teeth at God. They're going to be arguing with God. After all, we did this in your name and that in your name. And when they search the Bible for answers, the answers will only come to them. I never knew you. And you are, you are under the wrath of God and there is no escape. Mr. Camping, can I ask you one more question? Yes. Okay. Uh, for, uh, we'll skip this for now. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'd appreciate it if you would uh, reread your own book on page 65, and maybe you'll understand what I'm talking about there. But, okay, I want to know, what happened to the people of Nineveh? Did they stay true to God? Well, we know that they were saved because we read in Matthew 12 that the men of Nineveh will arise uh, and and... Uh, bring condemnation upon those who are living in our day. In other words, they are going to be raised with their glorified spiritual body, proving that the gospel, that they had the true gospel, and that, like the Word of God itself, brings condemnation upon those who are not saved. And so uh, they... Uh, they are a beautiful illustration. We can learn very much from them of what we ought to be doing in this day. They had been given a date when destruction would come. We have been given a date when destruction will come. They responded by trying to do God's will and by pleading with God for mercy. Maybe, maybe God might change his mind. And that is 
to exactly what each of us ought to be doing at this time. I'm just trying to remember that part from the Bible. If on down the road did the people of Nineveh and their descendants remain true to worshiping God? Oh, excuse me. The Bible doesn't get into that. God is giving us a snapshot of this one time in the history of the people of Nineveh. Their children probably never did become saved. Nineveh uh, it was uh, later on continued as a very na- wicked nation. But insofar as this one group of people that were living in that particular moment of history, they became saved. And that's the only snapshot that God gives us of them. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, can you hear me? (laughs) Open Forum, go ahead with your call, please. Can, Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? I'm sorry, I cannot uh, f- hear what you are saying. We're going to have to go to another caller. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good hey, Camping. How you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you. I have a question. Before you were saying about the people that are being saved before the foundation of the earth, and then you said that there was a multitude that no one can number saving today. Is that separate from the people that were saved years ago and Jesus is saving people today or is it the same from the foundation of the earth to the same people of today when God planned the fortunes of this world the affairs of this world it was all fully planned and and uh, taken care of all that was required before God ever began creation so that God knew who he was going to save 13,000 years ago, and he knew he was who he's going to save today. That was all taken care of then. We have to pause for this message. A question has been raised, which is a very valid question. Is salvation the same throughout history? In other words, did uh, uh, Moses who became saved, did he come into the kingdom of God with a different plan of some kind than someone today? Or what about David? Or what about uh, uh, Peter? Or anybody else? Did God have more than one plan? And the answer is no. There's there's only one plan. Uh, Whether it's Noah or, or... Uh, whether it's uh, Moses or David or Peter or someone who uh, becomes saved today, the plan of salvation is identical. God had to pay for all of their sins. God, in the person of the Lord Jesus, uh, had to endure the death penalty on their behalf. And uh, and, uh, God... Uh, had to apply that word of God at some point in their life to their life and so that they got a new resurrected soul and on the last day they're going to also receive a new resurrected body. There's only one plan and it has not changed at all throughout history. But now shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. How you doing, Brother Captain? Very well, thank you. I have two questions. The first, the first question is, uh, the first time that Jesus came, did he, did he come as a thief in the night for some people and just, uh, and for other people he came as they already knew he was coming? The, when Jesus came the first time, he, God does not use the language thief in the night at all. Uh, they, uh, a few people did have an idea that it was time for him to come. 
for example, uh, remember there was uh, the, uh, the one that came into the temple and said, The Lord has told me that I would not see death until I see the Lord's Messiah. Uh, uh, so he knew. Uh, Anna had some idea that it was time. Elizabeth and uh, Zechariah, who gave birth to John the Baptist. They knew very closely when the Christ would born, be born, before he was born. So it was uh, Christ, did, while he came to, while he only a very few people knew that he was going to come, nevertheless, it was known in the world. But it was not God's purpose at that time to broadcast this information at all. It was not God's purpose. That that was going to happen after Christ went to the cross and went back to heaven and the Holy Spirit was poured out in 33 A.D. Then he gave the command to the churches to go into all the world and bring the gospel. They were to declare to the world that Christ had come. So, so this time, this time when he come, he, he, I mean, people should already know, right? It's an entirely different situation. We know ahead of time the very day that he is going to come, because God, in His mercy, is giving us time to cry out to Him, to recognize our sinful condition, and hopefully that. Uh, we too might become saved. That's all the mercy of God. Well, uh, it's uh, we can't. Once He comes, it's all over, and so it has to be declared ahead of time. It had to come from the Bible, and by God's mercy, God has guided us through the Bible so that we're able to determine with great accuracy, with many proofs from the Bible that we know when he is coming. And now it's very close at hand. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Harold. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, Can you please turn to Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18, please? Yes, Revelation 13, that passage is talking about Christ or about Satan as he is installed in the churches throughout the uh, day of uh, the, uh, the uh, period of the Great Tribulation, the 23-year, the 8,400-day period that we're presently in and getting near to the end of. And we read there... <laughs> that Satan, as he is, as he is uh, heading up uh, or ruling in the churches, doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by those miracles which he had, uh, which he did in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast. That beast is also Satan, which had the wound of a, by a sword and did live. And he was given, and he was, and it was given to him to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, what is your question? Okay, um, I have two questions. Okay, we are in the Great Tribulation, obviously, because uh, Jesus is coming on May 21st, 2011. Now, what is this mark and no one can buy and sell except by it. And also, what is the meaning of the number of the man? It's so confusing, the 666 thing. Can you explain yeah. that, please? Yes. Uh, you see, uh, later on, when you read the first verse of 
Revelation 14. We read, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, this later on, when we work through this, 144,000, we know that that's the fullness, the complete fullness, of all those who would become saved throughout the church age during that 1955-year period. Now, when we look at people in churches during the church age, did we see anybody with God's name on their foreheads? And, of course, we did not. This is spiritual language or uh, uh, allegorical language to indicate they are owned by God. They have the name of God on their forehead. They belong to God. Now, by the same token, those in the churches during the time uh, when Satan is ruling there, they have the mark of Satan. Uh, Again, it's not a physical or literal mark of any kind, but it's language to indicate that those who are in the churches who remain there are owned by Satan. Now, they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark of the beast. In the Bible, when we study the Bible carefully, we find that God utilizes the idea of sending out the gospel like it is merchandise. The ships of Tarshish went out and brought in gold and so on. They were merchandising. We read in Isaiah 55, uh, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come, buy wine and milk. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's the cry of the merchant. And But within the churches during the Great Tribulation, when Satan rules there, nobody could merchandise. That is, nobody could preach there uh, uh, crying out the gospel unless they had the mark of the beast. This is terrible language. It indicates that those preachers who are still in the churches and, and most preachers have remained there, they're under the authority of Satan. They're not under the authority of Christ at all. Now, the number of his name is 666, and when we break that down, it is a number that is pointing to judgment. It is 37 times 3 times 3 times 2. Uh, It is the number 37 invariably is used in the Bible to signify those who are on their way to judgment. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38. Let's look at that. Ezekiel 38. Yes. And what is what verses? What verses did you want to look at? Oh, my. Have we lost our caller? Shall we take our next call? Hello. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Hello? Yes. Well, Mr. Camping, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Well, I've listened to you for quite a few years, and I really, really appreciate what you've done and how you've taught. But I have a couple of questions, and the probable biggest question I have is you, you teach that there's nothing we can do to gain salvation, correct? Right. But you you also teach that everybody should read the Bible and pray for mercy. And isn't that an action of trying to get salvation? 
hoping that maybe God might save. And God is saving today a great multitude which no man can number. So it's a very, very good hope. More than that, we read that God is not a respecter of persons. I have just as much possibility of having been one of the elect as anybody else. But I have to wait upon God. I cannot dictate to God. And I I know that by reading the Bible and trying to be obedient, I placed myself in an environment where faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I still have to wait upon God. I cannot get I cannot insist to God, now, I've met all the requirements, you have to save me. It's still 100% the unfathomable mercy of God. Okay, I have one more question. Um, As we've been taught over the years that before the foundation of the world was ever started, that the elect, the Lamb's Book of Life, the elected that were to be saved, were written in that book, correct? It was all written before God did any part of his creation. Then why, if that's the case, and and, and I really always have had problems with this, if that's the case, then then why why would God create such a horrible place knowing that 90 or better percent of the people that have been created over time Ah. are going to be destroyed. Ah, you see, now we are learning that God has created principalities and powers in the heavenlies. We read about this, for example, in in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. And uh, God is God, and he's not confined to just planet Earth. But uh, when we read about these principalities and powers, we read, for example, that when we go to heaven, we neither marry nor are given in marriage. Uh, We read that uh, where God is, uh, that is not where sin dwells. And so then we begin to ask a lot of insistent questions. Well, how come this principality and power called planet Earth, this world that we're living in, why is it so different? Why, from almost from the beginning, it's been a cesspool of sin. Uh, People marry and are given in marriage. Uh, It is entirely different from anything we would expect as we read the rest of the Bible about the holiness of God. Why? Why? And, and we, we, we wonder, what really is the purpose? And the purpose shines through when we read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. This becomes a very important question or, or verse where we read in verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers, whatever there are out there, and God is an infinite God from eternity past, so there may be a great many of them, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenlies might be known by the church, now the church here, are only those who were written in the Lamb's Book of Life, those who actually did become saved, those who had been chosen to become saved, that by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. You see, in God's master plan, and we don't understand all of this at all, but at least we can get us some very definite insights. In God's master plan, God is infinite in his attributes, in his love, in his mercy, in his kindness, in his justice, in his 
in his uh, every aspect of his being. He is glorious, glorious. And so God created this particular principality, this particular kingdom called planet Earth, in, for a special purpose, not to exist forevermore in all of its glory with Christ reigning here. No, that's true of the others. But so that through God's dealings with what happened here, the others in the other principalities and the powers could get an idea, could view the enormous glory of Christ. In other words, the whole business of this creation is to demonstrate to the principalities and powers the enormous glory and wonder and praise of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they are witnesses of a world that quickly was plunged into sin, that quickly was ruled over by a wicked, uh, a wicked uh, uh, angel called Lucifer, who, uh, where uh, they see God's mercy manifested again and again and again. They see God's patience. They see all kinds of aspects of God's glory uh, as they're viewing what has happened on planet Earth and all the complexities of uh, bringing this uh, whole Earth through uh, to its final, final uh, po point 13,023 years after it was created. And it was all to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, that is, uh, suddenly we learn that and we see why we are so different. Now God did this with great care. He did it very objectively before he ever created this earth. He already made provision to, uh, to save those that are, would be the church, all those who would become born again. That was already done. And then when he created this earth, yes, it was perfect. Yes, it was perfect. But already he began to make moves that showed he had another plan. Because why would he put a Garden of Eden in a perfect universe, a perfect earth? Uh, that shows that there's going to be levels of perfection. Uh, that's because later on, as a matter of fact, the kingdom of God was represented by the Garden of Eden and outside was represented by those who are, are not in the kingdom of God. Why would he cause Adam and Eve to bear children? So that the moment that Adam sinned because all of the descendants of Adam and Eve were already in the loins of Adam and Eve, so that when he sinned, the whole world would be plunged into sin. Billions of people would come into this world already, uh, con 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 uh, already co under the death penalty because they were born in sin, conceived and born in sin. And all of this now fits together because through all of this and why did he later on uh, have Christ have to go through this whole business of suffering again even though the sins had already been paid for why did he have to demonstrate how Christ suffered so that not only we but all the principal also the principalities and powers could really see the, in that enormously marvelous tableau, they, they could see how real, real Christ had to suffer, how genuine his suffering was as he was, as he was ruthlessly, uh, uh, shamefully, uh, 
put to death as a convict because of our sins and all the other things that happened to the Lord Jesus. So that now we now we have an objective reason why planet Earth is what it is, why it had a timeline to it, why it came to an end, whereas normally what God creates go on for each goes on for eternity. We can see why sin has come here, and we can understand a whole lot when we focus it on the fact that through this. Christ is being glorified. Christ is being shown to all the ages of the past how glorious he really is. And therefore, the final end of it all is to God be the glory. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. How are you? Very well, thank you. I, I just have one comment, Brother Camping. You, in the past, I work for the New York City Fire Department, and May 21st, I see comes for many people, as tonight, it will be their end. And you used to preach, it didn't matter if we knew or we didn't know what day Christ would come, because it could come in a, twink, in a blink of an eye, like I'll see tonight. Now, you're so dogmatic. But May 21st, you're not informing, and like you used to, tell people how the end could be in this very next moment. Well, as a matter of fact, if you listen to what you are hearing on the open forum or from family radio, you will hear many things that are different than were taught earlier in your earlier years. Because the gospel the word of God is given to us as to correct us all scripture the Bible says is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine that is for teaching and for correction and so as we learn from the Bible we're going to be corrected and the first one who better be corrected is the teacher uh, and then he, in turn, has to admit that he uh, needed further, that God gave him further information. And so those who are listening can be corrected. Uh, unfortunately, you hear very few preachers that will ever admit that they have been corrected, that they have taught something in the past that was contrary to what the Bible taught. And that's because of pride. But if we walk very humbly, we know we're going to be corrected because the Bible is a learning process. It is a marvelous book that we keep learning from. And from time to time, we're going to be corrected. Okay. But thank you. I under no, I understand that. All my point is to remind people that May 21st very well indeed may be the day that Christ comes. But for many... It's going to come before then, and that they should be prepared every day, not till May 21st. Well, that is the way we are, were always taught in, uh, throughout the church age. You, at the moment you die, Christ has come for you. And certainly that is still true. But that, that doesn't hold a candle to the awful, to the awesome, to the uh, wonder that we know that less than three years from now, suddenly it's all over, all over. That's, that's, that's a huge piece of information. As a matter of fact, when we talk about he might come for me in death uh, at any time, yeah, that's the way we were taught. Uh, Christ is coming as a thief in the night, even our physical death was not known normally ahead of time. But now uh, we are given a piece of information that is far more important and imperative that we consider, that we know that within three years it's all over. What are we doing with our life? 
now that we have less than three years. What, how are we living? Are we facing the fact, uh, honestly, and, and that, that in less than three years it's all over, and yet I'm still young and healthy, and I, uh, ordinarily I have my world in front of me? It's a different piece of information, I'll tell you. But again, we want to thank you for calling and sharing. Now we're going to pause in just a moment for another message. And then right after that, we'll go to our final half hour. We're continuing with the Open Forum program. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Camping, can you read Acts 24.25, please? Acts 24.25. There we read... Acts 24, 25, there we read, um, and as he reasoned of righteousness, Acts 24, 25, and as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Is that the verse? When I, hello? I'm sorry? Yeah, well, I called the other night and I asked you the question, Why would Felix tremble about judgment to come? And you never answered the question and I was never uh, back, uh, allowed back on. Um, I was wondering if you could answer it. Why Felix trembled when he heard about judgment to come? You know, every man knows, every per human knows there is a God. That is the way we are created. Every human being knows that there is a God they have to answer to. The law of God has been written on their heart. Now, normally, mankind lives oblivious to this. They don't want to think about those serious things. They're enjoying life. They're doing what they want to do. But when they are seriously confronted with the fact that there is a judgment day coming, they, they are about to tremble. That's why the world goes into denial when it has to do with the, talking about a specific date of Christ's return. I've had the experience where I have talked with individuals who uh, are not uh, interested in the Bible particularly. They're, they've never been a part of the church scene at all. And yet I have told them very, and described to them very seriously what I have found about the return of Christ. And they visibly tremble. They are, they know, they somehow, they are frightened. But they go away normally and, and go into denial. They don't want to face that. But every human being, when they get at all honest with themselves, know that they have to finally answer to God. Paul reassure Felix and say, well, you'll, you'll be annihilated, but you won't know about it. You'll just be a pile of dust when that judgment does come, and you won't experience anything. You'll just be ashamed to God. God will be ashamed, but you won't be ashamed because you don't exist anymore, because when you're dead, you're dead. So why, why didn't he do that? As a, as a Christian, tell him that, you know, if you, if you die before May 21st, 2011, which he did, and all these people did, why would he tell them that, uh, that the, the judgment well, should no, come? Because we are, we are told about, that we are commanded to tell people they're under the judgment of God. Now, God did not outline the whole judgment process. For example, the judgment to come includes that these individuals have lost their birthright. They are no longer able to be, uh, to have eternal life or to be inheritors of the new heaven and the new earth. Now, that is an enormous loss, an enormous loss. 
And, and, but that's what happens when, when we talk about judgment to come. Insofar as what they feel, yes, it's, and, and incidentally, that makes great comfort for us. We've all had relatives, we've had friends who have died, and, and, uh, they've never given any evidence of being a child of God, and now we don't have to weep and mourn over the fact, oh, my dear father, my dear mother is in he- is going to be in hell forevermore, uh, being punished by, uh, by God for their sins. Uh, oh, my dear child that died and uh, gave no evidence of being a child of God is going to be in hell forever. Now we can know, oh, by God's mercy, Yes, they have lost a whole lot. It had cost them a great deal because they died in their sin. But at least they are not experiencing, uh, consciously experiencing that wrath any, anymore. And what a great mercy of God. No wonder Jesus wept over Jerusalem. No wonder, he said, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And so it helps us to begin to understand afresh the marvelous mercy of God. In the Gospel, do you tell people that if they die before May 21st, 2011, they won't have to experience the wrath of God, but if they don't die before May 21st, they will experience the full wrath of God? When Wait, excuse me, that, you're not saying it correctly. If they die before May 21st, they will experience aspects of the wrath of God. Death itself is an integral part of the wrath of God. The fact that they've lost the inheritance, that is also an integral part of the wrath of God. Now, they don't know that they have lost the inheritance. They never thought about it. But nevertheless, that was part of the wrath of God. They are going to be shamed before God and before the principalities and powers. They won't experience any feelings about that, but nevertheless, that is an integral part of the wrath of God. We have to come with the full story and not with just... You know, people today, why do they want people... The idea of uh, people having to be in a place called hell bearing terrible punishment forevermore. Their little five-year-old who gives no evidence of salvation. Uh, Their uh, wife who never cared about the church. Uh, Their uh, father or mother who died unsafe. Why do they want that? For And are they weeping? Where's their love for their fellow man? We're commanded to love God above all and our neighbor as ourselves. And yet, where is the love when we, uh, when we are, are really uh, storming? We've got, no, 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 they've got to be punished, though. Uh, they, they didn't get saved. they got to be punished. They're going to be in hell forevermore. Where in the world is their mercy? Where is their love for our fellow man? in that kind of an attitude, which is so prevalent today. It just shocks me that this is so prevalent. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. How are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. Good. Um, I just wanted to bring um, something to your attention. There was a caller earlier this evening that was asking about um, that verse in the Bible, a great multitude which no man can number. Yes. Um, I, I think his question was, um, is that phrase, um, a great multitude, um, is that speaking about just today, just our, our day, or is it speaking about a great multitude throughout the history of time? No, it is particularly focusing on our day during the Great Tribulation. You must, or that is the final 6,100 days 
of the great tribulation when God is uh, saving a great many people today. What is really uh, uh, hard to uh, stomach, it's hard to uh, accept, is that when we study the Bible very carefully and learn everything we can from the the church records, and uh, there are lots of records, uh, particularly during the New Testament era in the last 500 years, we find that any time in history prior to the end of the church age, there never has been very many people saved. It's always been so tiny. We find that when Jesus was preaching, very few people, few people became saved. The exception was at Pentecost, when about 3,000 are saved. But then right on the heels of that, the church of, uh, of uh, or some of the churches were already following a different gospel altogether. Uh, and then as we go through the Dark Ages, and we go through the... Uh, the time of the Reformation. Yes, there were there were a few men who were raised up and who for a while preached f uh, reasonably faithfully, but it wasn't long at all. And the whole gospel message became a man-centered, man-made gospel. You can do it. You can get yourself saved. And that has been the dominant gospel of of every church all through the church age and so where are all these great multitudes throughout history path there's hardly there's very few I think that the the most most of the people and I, we don't know this for positive certainty but I do know that in these days when God is not using a, an organization he it's a direct situation between God and man, and God insists that this is the way it is today, that it is in this day, as the last become first and the first become last, that there's a great multitude that are coming in uh, to the kingdom of God. We don't know where they are. We don't know who they are. That's up to God. But they are hearing the gospel, and they're responding uh, in a way that God is saving them. Thank you, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, sir. Um, one, uh, uh, three questions, really. It doesn't relate to each other, but first off, uh, question is the six-day creation. That is both a historical and parabolic. Uh, first of all, it is an actual fact of history that God created everything in six days of 24 hours. However, in the process of creation, God also is, is setting forth, uh, uh, giving us, uh, uh, in allegorical fashion, uh, ideas about his salvation plan. For example, right in, at the beginning, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the whole earth was a void, and, uh, and darkness brooded on the face of the deep, or it was without form, or, or uh, how does it go? Let me, let me look at that again. Uh, we read there. Uh, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the earth. And God said... Let there be light. Now, that was a thumbnail sketch of how the world would go. It would come into the darkness of sin, total darkness, and then the Holy Spirit would begin to be active in the world and bring the light of the gospel. Uh, that, uh, uh, that is already anticipated here in verse 2 of Genesis 1. Yes, sir. One more question. A question about anger, right? Um, anger is a, is, a, is a sin, which is which is ingrained in every every person because everybody gets angry at some point. And is 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 that 
sinful, the action after the anger, or the anger itself is sinful? Well, the the action of becoming angry is a sinful action. Uh, it is not the anger that's sin. It's the fact that I have become angry. It is my sin. Uh, the fact that... Uh, 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 that's what all sin is. It's what I do. And, and whether it's becoming angry or whether it's I'm not going to forgive someone or whether I'm going to resent uh, what someone has done to me, uh, it, the, the sin is what I do with these things as they become a part of my life. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Brother Campy. Yes. Uh, if we repent like the people of Nineveh repent, uh, do you think uh, God uh, will spare us on May 21st of 2011? Well, maybe, maybe. You know, they were not told that God would repent. God in his mercy did repent. But we never dictate to God. And today also, as we, as we repent and cry to God for mercy, we hope that God will be merciful. We don't deserve it at all. We're sinners. We deserve the wrath of God. But maybe God will be merciful. And there give, God gives us great hope because, as I've indicated, he's not a respecter of persons. We could just as well be one of his chosen ones as anybody else we know that there's a great multitude today that are being saved and we might be included in that so we have great hope but under no circumstance do we ever dictate to God or take a position like I've done it all everything right now you've got to save me no that indicates we don't understand that it's only the mercy of God, only the mercy of God, that we become saved. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take the next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Welcome back. Yes. Could I get some feedback on Ecclesiastes chapter 1? Ecclesiastes chapter one. Let's look at that. And and which verse? It's, uh, yes, uh, verse nine through eleven. The thing that hath been it was that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Okay, what is your question? Um, I don't really have one. It's a brand new verse for me, and I never, ever heard it in church. And Yeah, you know, very mysterious. this has always been a mysterious passage. But now it's not mysterious anymore. Because think of it, before the foundation of the world, before there was any creation, God already knew every human that would ever be born. He already had to put their names down. He already knew those that he was going to save. He already knew every sin that they would commit because they had to be laid upon Christ in order that he might make payment before he ever created the world. So actually, uh, it's like God knew everything about this world before it ever was created. And there's nothing new under the sun. It is simply that now it is being worked out as a living tableau showing the principalities and powers how God worked through all of the misery of this world. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? 
Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, my name is Daryl, and uh, I have one question. Uh, you always say that May 21st is when the Lord's going to come back. But in the past, even Noah didn't know the day when um, the Lord was going to end the world in flood. And also when oh, excuse they me. were trying to excuse, excuse me, finish, please. Excuse me. Noah did know. God told him seven days before, seven days from now, the flood waters will come. For seven days, he was able to, to to preach to the people who now would have certainly, uh, in their amazement at what the kooky things this man was doing, and as the animals were gathering round about, uh, and he was preaching to them the date, the precise day when the flood waters come, and the Bible says that on the seventh day, God shut the door. And the flood waters came, just exactly as Jonah was given the exact date, forty days, and the world, and you're going to be destroyed. So we can't say that Noah did not know. He absolutely did know, and he published it. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, brother Camping. Yes. Oh, it's so good to hear from you. It's so good to know that you're back and doing well. You sound great. Oh, it's only the mercy of God, believe you me. Yes, sir. Brother Camp, I haven't spoken to you in a while. I'm so glad that I have the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, I had a question about, um, uh, I guess, the dead. Can a person that's living pray for God's mercy to the dead? Oh, absolutely not. There's no point in that at all. When our person dies, his eternal destiny is absolutely sealed. There's a, if he died a child of God, he will receive a glorified spiritual body on May 21, 2011. If he died unsaved, he's dead. He'll never, never have conscious existence again. Okay, because I was remember the, the story of Lazarus, and when uh, I think it was Lazarus when Jesus um, raised him, uh, it said Lazarus come out. Wasn't that because of the um, the sisters that were um, um, sad that he passed away, and Jesus found pity on him on them? Well, Jesus raised Lazarus, who was a child of God, who was not dead. That is. Uh, he was uh, still living uh, in his soul existence, and God uh, did a miracle of giving him also a, uh, a living body again in order to show that Christ is the resurrection and the life, that he has the, the power to do these things. And uh, it's really focusing on the fact that God has the power to raise us from the grave on the last day if we are a child of God uh, to raise us up and give us a glorified spiritual body. All right. Well, Brother Campin, you keep up the good work. Again, I listen to you every night, and my prayers are with you and your family, and thank you so much, Brother Campin, for, for being such a great inspiration to all of us here. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hi, Brother Camping. On the subject of predestination, I'm wondering why would an all-knowing God predetermine before the foundations of the earth who will be saved and who will not be saved, and then put them on the earth to play it out and hurt each other only to come to the same conclusion that he predesigned? Well, that's God's business, you see. As we live out our life, God, through our life and how God deals with each individual, is glorifying himself. Think of the mercy of God that is demonstrated again and again. Think of the patience of God as he allows sin to continue for so long. Think of the uh, power of God that he's able to raise uh, people from dead to life. Think of the 
uh, all the attributes of God, the justice of God, that Christ himself endured the full wrath of God in order to make payment for the sins of those that he came to save. The attributes and the characteristics of God are all put in, on in public display. And that's where the focus is. It's not upon us. It's upon Christ and what he had to do, what he had to endure, and, and how he glorified himself through all of this. What would be the point of going through the motions if, if at the end everything was already predetermined? And it happens exactly the way God designed it to happen. Because through it all, God, God's uh, the, the glory and the attributes and the and the wonder of who Christ is is being shown. Uh, what was the purpose of even creating the world if this is the way it was all going to go? Well, then there was no there was no way to show to the create to the principalities and powers that God has created in the past the, these glorious characteristics of Christ but we this whole world has been on display you and I are on display to the principalities and powers and as God works his patience his repent his uh, uh, kindness his uh, and so on and so on and his anger and his justice and his whatever uh, it is all demonstrating to uh, to whoever we don't know who they are God knows who they are demonstrating how wonderful how absolutely wonderful glorious Christ is that he is to get all the glory and praise but then we don't understand that, of course. But God does. And these people who are watching, whoever they are, who are watching, they are able thus to glorify God more than ever. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our last call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Kemp. Yes. Uh, chap uh, Psalm chapter... 139. Uh, which chapter? Uh, 139. I know, but, oh, oh, I'm sorry. We're not going to be able to take your call. Okay, no we're, problem. We're right up to the end. I'm sorry. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night. <laughs>